Thank you, Father. Um, uh, guys, we have a, actually a couple words to share, and, and I believe the Spirit is doing something amazing among the body, um, among uh, believers. He is he's sifting. I've seen um, people who've made mistakes have a brokenness, and you're seeing the real church come out. Um, I have something to share. Um, I think Ramon had something to share, and then Leanne had something to share. Um, Thomas Akempis, in Book Three of the thirty-third chapter, "Restlessness of Soul," directing our final intention toward God, um, the voice of Christ. He says like this: "Just picture Jesus speaking, my child. Do not trust in your present feeling, for it will soon give way to another." As long as you live, you will be subject to changeableness in spite of yourself. You will become merry at one time and sad at another, now peaceful but again disturbed, at one moment devout and the next in devout, sometimes diligent while at other times lazy, now grave and again flippant. But the man who is wise, or woman who is wise and whose spirit is well instructed, stands superior to these changes. He pays no attention to what he feels in himself, or from what quarter the wind of fickleness blows, so long as the whole intention of his mind is conducive to his proper and desired end. I shared with um, one of the kids the other day to have an inner resolve, you know, come, pardon the phrase, hell or high water. You know, as for me and my house, I'm, I'm doing this and I'm not, I'm not going to give up. Uh, for thus he can stand undivided unchanged and unshaken with the singleness of his intention directed unwaveringly toward me even in the midst of so many changing events and the purer this singleness of intention is with so much the more constancy does he pass through many storms but in many ways the eye of pure intention grows dim because it is attracted to any delightful thing that it needs indeed it is a rare find to find one who is entirely free from all taint of self-seeking the Jews of old, for example, came to Bethany, to Martha and Mary, not for Jesus' sake alone, but in order to see Lazarus. The eye of your intention, therefore, must be cleansed so that it is single and right. It must be directed toward me, despite all the objects which may interfere. Um, you want to read your, your chapter? You had something to share? You just, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> This is a this is a, a book by S. L. Bringle called "Helps the Holiness." Um, this particular chapter is uh, a good word for now. Um, a good word for the season of whatever you're in, whether it's seeking the Lord in an unusual way, in an unusual, uh, by, by that I mean you are putting off everything else in your life so much to the point that your face is set like a flint to seek God. You're taking him at his word, holding on to his promise that says where he says, if you seek me, you'll find me. Um, I'm going to read it. I'm not going to give much commentary because I really, I think it really speaks for itself. It's, it's about three pages. So here we go. A friend with whom I once billeted, which is housing soldiers, claimed the blessing of a clean heart and testified to it at the breakfast table the next morning. He said he doubted whether there was such an experience, but since going to the Salvation Army, he had been led to the study Bible and observed the lives of those who professed the blessing, and he had come to the conclusion that he could not serve God acceptably without holiness of heart. The difficulty was to reach the point where he would take it by faith. He said he had expected to get it at some time, he had hoped for it, and that he had looked forward to the time when he would when he should be pure but finally he saw that it must be claimed and right there began his fight of faith 
He took hold of one end of the promise and the devil got hold of the other end and they pulled and they fought for victory. The devil had often gotten the victory before. This time the man would not cast away his confidence but came boldly unto quoting but came boldly unto the throne of grace unquote Hebrews 4:16. The devil was conquered by faith and the brother walked off with the blessing of a clean heart. That morning he said quoting God filled me with the spirit last night end quote while the glad tones of his face and the bright light of his face backed up his words the last thing a soul has to give up when seeking salvation or sanctification is quoting an evil heart of unbelief end quote Hebrews 3:12 this is Satan's stronghold you may drive him from all his outposts and he does not care much about that but when you assail this citadel, he will resist you with all the lies and cunning he can command. He does not care much if people give up outward sin. A respectable sinner will suit his purpose quite as well as the most distributable. In fact, I am not sure that some people are worse than the devil wants them to be, for they are a bad advertisement for him. Nor does he care very much if people indulge in a hope of salvation or of purity. Indeed, I suspect he likes them to do so, if he can get them to stop there. But let a poor soul say, quoting, I want to know I am saved now. I, want, I must have the blessing now. I can't live any longer without the witness of the Spirit that Jesus saves me now and cleanses me now, end quote. And the devil will begin to roar and lie and use all his wits to deceive that soul to switch it onto some sidetrack or rock it to sleep with the promise of victory at some future time. This is where the devil really begins. Many people say they are fighting the devil and do not know what fighting the devil means. It is a fight of faith in which the soul takes hold of the promise of God and holds on to it and believes it and declares it to be true in spite of all the devil's lies, in spite of all circumstances and feelings to the contrary, and obeys God, whether God seems to be fulfilling the promise or not. When a soul gets to the point where he or she will do this and will hold fast to the profession of faith without wavering, he or, or she will soon get out of the fogs and mists and twilight of doubt and uncertainty into the broad day of perfect assurance. Such a, such a soul shall know that Jesus saves and sanctifies and shall be filled with a humbling yet utterly joyful sense of God's everlasting love and favor. A friend whom I love as my own soul sought the blessing of a clean heart and gave up everything but this, an evil and unbelief, uh, an evil heart of unbelief, but did not understand that he was holding on to that. He waited for God to give him the blessing, and the devil whispered to him, You say that you are on the altar of God, but you don't feel any different. Quote. The evil heart of unbelief in the poor fellow's heart took the devil's part and said, quote, That is so. End quote. So my friend felt all discouraged, and he and the devil got the victory. Again, he gave himself up after a hard struggle, all but the evil heart of unbelief. Again, the devil whispered, You say you are all the Lord's, but you don't feel as the other folks say they felt when they yielded all to God. The evil heart of unbelief again said, that's so. Again, the man fell through unbelief and agreed with the devil. Mm. A third time, after much effort, he sought the blessing and gave God all except the evil heart of unbelief. The third time, the devil whispered, quoting, "You say you are all the Lord's, but you know that a quick temp but you know what a quick temper you have. Now, how do you know? Uh, excuse me. Now, how do you know?" But what next week, and excuse me, now how do you know, but what next week an unlooked for temptation may come and will overthrow you, end quote. Again, the evil heart of unbelief said, that's so. And for the third time, my friend was beaten back from the prize. 
But at last he spoke, but at last he became so desperate in his hunt for God and in his desire for holiness and the Spirit's witness that there and then he was willing for God to show him all of the depravity of his soul. And God showed him that his that it was his evil heart of unbelief that had been listening to the devil's voice and taking the devil's part all the time. Good people, good professing Christians, do not like to admit that they have an unbelief remaining in them. But until they acknowledge all the evil that is in them and take God's part against themselves or agree with God, he cannot sanctify them. Again, he came and put his all on the altar and God and told God he would trust him. Again, the devil whispered, you don't feel any different, end quote. But this time the man hushed the evil spirit of unbelief and answered, quoting, I don't care if I don't feel any different. I am the Lord's. Glory. But Amen. you don't feel as other folks say they feel, whispered the devil. I don't care if I don't. I am the Lord's. Amen. And he can bless me or not, just as he pleases. But there... But there is your quick temper, the devil, the devil said. I don't care. I am the Lord's. I will trust him to uh, manage any temp any to to manage my temper. I am the Lord's. Mm. I am the Lord's. Amen. He replied. And there he stood, resisting the devil, steadfast in faith. First Peter, uh, five nine, and refusing to listen to the suggestions of an evil heart of unbelief. All that day and the following night. Uh, all that day and night and the following day. There was a stillness in his soul and a mixed determination, or excuse me, and a fixed determination to stand on the promises of God forever, whether God blessed him or not. About 10 o'clock the second night, as he was getting ready for bed, without any unusual expectation or premonition, God fulfilled his ancient promise, quoting, The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Amen. Malachi 3 1. Ooh. Jesus, the Son of God, was revealed in him and made known to his spiritual conscience until he was, quote, lost in wonder, love, and praise, end quote. Oh, how exalted and triumphed in God his Savior. Oh, how he exalted and triumphed in God his Savior and rejoiced that he felt that he held fast his faith and resisted the devil. Now, Every soul that gets into the kingdom of God must come to this point. The soul must die to sin, renounce all unbelief, and give up all doubts. He or she must consent to be, quote, crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. When this is done, that soul will touch God. Feel the fire of his love and be filled with his power, as surely as an electric streetcar receives power when proper connection is made with the wire above. May God help you to see that, quote, now is just the right time, 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Remember, if you are giving all up to God, everything that makes you doubt is from Satan and not from God. Mm. And God commands you to resist the devil and stay strong in faith, 1 Peter 5, 9. Do not cast away your confidence, which has a great reward, Hebrews 10, 35. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You are so good. Man. Um, um, Lord gave this to me a couple days ago, and I'm just amazed because uh, it all just is folding in on it on itself. Um, Complimentary, like. Lord gives us all a little bit of the of the message He's trying to share, and um, and that's how you know it's the Spirit, because it's all the same Spirit. So thank you, Lord. But I just pray right now that uh, any words that would be spoken would be of You, and it would just be for the building up of the body. Lord, forgive me. If I fumble and don't accurately represent you, Lord, I you know my heart. Lord, I just pray that I'd be out of the way and the Spirit would speak. Mm. And all that needs to come out will come out. And you'll put it all in the right order. 
Um, Lord, I pray for opening uh, broken up ground, ground that's ready to hear your word and to receive your refreshing and that much growth would come. Lord, that it would be um, a place of, of encouragement that we're brought to to follow wholeheartedly after you, to believe your word, to speak it out, that it is true, whether or not we feel it, Amen. whether or not we see it. Lord, may we hold on fast to you, especially when we don't see it. In your name we ask it, Lord Jesus, right now. So we're going to be on Mark, um, and it's Mark 13. Give you a little background as to where we are here. Um, Mark 12. Um, we have the the religious leader comes at this. You know, he's Jesus is heading to the cross, and we're past the traditional Palm Sunday. You know, they're coming in, and the the people are excited because. Christ is going to now, in their mind, overthrow the Roman government, and restore Israel back to its former glory. And many people are believing that he is, in fact, the Messiah, and they're expecting a certain political uh, overthrow to happen, and they're hoping for it. And so um, there's, of course, the, the lines have been drawn the religious leaders and so forth are on the other side, and they are trying to um, discredit the Lord. And so they send several people to ask him some tough questions and tough situations. And there's a religious scholar in here who comes up and says, what's the greatest commandment in the scriptures? And Yeshua, uh, Jesus answers, and he says... The Lord our God, the Lord is when he answers with the Shema. And then he says, and the greatest commandment is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, these two things, you know, these are the, the greatest commandments. And the religious leader responds and says, you're right, you've spoken well. Uh, which always makes me giggle that the religious leader would have the guts to say that. Can I have that over there? Thank you. Um, but Jesus responds back to him and he says, you know, after this religious leader had the guts to say, you're right, uh, Jesus says, you're not far off from the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> so it's sort of a funny interchange between them. So that happens here. And this is the mindset. Everybody is talking about this kingdom. It's not too indifferent from where we found ourselves this past fall, where everybody was talking about the kingdom that was going on in, in America, <laughs> where everybody has an opinion of how it's going to go down. And we all had hopes and dreams and aspirations for an overthrow of unrighteousness and a promotion of righteousness. And we all sort of hoped for the best. And even when things started to turn south, I think most of us hoped for the best. And this is sort of the climate that you find Israel in. They're under an oppressive government, and they're hoping that maybe this Jesus, this Yeshua, will come in and save the day and squelch Rome and put righteousness. Rome was horrible. They were horribly oppressive. And, and maybe he'll come in and restore righteousness, and, and not just righteousness, but bring a lifting up of the head of Israel because they had been humiliated by Rome. And so maybe they would be restored to their former glory the way it was before, just like we felt. Like maybe we'll return back to the foundation, to the Constitution. Maybe we'll go back to those, uh, the days of the Puritans where hard work ethic and, and simpler times and independence and freedom were the things that we spoke of. 
So uh, this is sort of the background. Um, there's a lot of things that happen in there uh, talking about Jesus seems very concerned about the, re the religious atmosphere in the next verses that follow. He talks about how when one of his disciples looks at the temple, this huge monstrosity that was put together architecturally incredible by Herod. I mean, slabs of marble that were humongous. I mean, it's like six feet wide, and, you know, huge. I don't know how they moved them into place. They're so heavy. And, uh, and he, you know, they're like, isn't this wonderful? And he goes, it's all going to be destroyed. It's all going to be laid bare, not, not one stone on top of another. And uh, not too many uh, days before that, he had cursed a fig tree, which is often stands for Israel. And he, he goes up to the tree, and the tree doesn't have fruit on it. And he says, may you never bear fruit. And uh, referring right back to the prophets. And he was talking about the system, this religious system. May you not bear fruit anymore. And, and the disciples are completely amazed that this tree just withered to its roots. The next day they walked by it. They went, oh my goodness. You know, look at what happened. And he's, and he's trying to tell them, but he does so in sort of a hidden language. This system's over. But he's also telling, this is what my kingdom's about. My kingdom is not about the political sphere that you're seeing and touching and living. And it's, it's a different kingdom. It's a different realm. And he's been telling them this since the beginning. And, and way back in Mark chapter 2, I believe it is, he talks about the kingdom of heaven is, is here, it's present, it's at the gates, and, um, and it's God's kingdom. And he was always a promoter of God's kingdom, but in their minds, all they could think is that God's kingdom equals Israel equals here. And that's all they could see. And that's we fall into that same trap. We tend to think God's kingdom equals America equals here. <laughs> and we make that connection. But his, God's kingdom is in America. Right. It's much bigger than that. And his view is eternal, not temporal. So this is sort of the background for it. So we see, uh, we're going to look at Mark 13. After the temple is predicted to be destroyed... He's, he goes and he goes up to the Mount of Olives and he ha he's sitting there and he's viewing the temple from a distance. And he would, from where he was sitting, he would have had like a panorama view of the temple. And we can only guess what he was thinking, but having just prophesied that the temple was going to be laid bare, I'm sure he was thinking about that. And so um, his disciples... James and John and, and Peter and Andrew come up to him and they say, tell us when these things are going to happen and what sign will, uh, will come about when this is all to take place. So this is all the response. And Jesus begins to tell them in verse 5 there, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will deceive many. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. These things must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of the birth pains. But you be on your guard. They will hand you over to the Sanhedrins, and you will be flogged in the synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings because of me as a witness to them. And the good news must first be proclaimed to all nations. So when they arrest you and hand you over, don't worry beforehand what you will say. On the contrary, whatever is given to you in that hour, say it. For it isn't you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Then brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. And children will rise up against parents and put them to death. And you will be hated by everyone because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be delivered. And when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it should not, let the reader understand, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. 
A man must go on the housetop, sorry, a man on the housetop must not come down or go in to get anything out of his house. And a man in the field must not go back to get his clothes. Woe to the pregnant woman and the nursing mothers in those days. Pray it won't happen in the winter, for those will be the days of tribulation, the kind that hasn't been from the beginning of the world, which God created until now, and never will be again. Unless the Lord limited those days, no one would survive. But he limited those days because of the elect whom he chose. Then if anyone tells you, look, here is the Messiah, look there, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and will perform signs and wonders and lead astray, if possible, even the elect. And you must watch. I've told you everything in advance. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not shed its light. The stars will be falling from the sky and the celestial powers will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great glory and power. And he will send out the angels and he'll gather the elect from the four winds, from the end of the earth to the end of the sky. Learn this parable from the fig tree. As soon as its branch becomes tender and sprouts, uh, and it sprouts leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, know that he is near at the door. I assure you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Now concerning the day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, except the Father. Watch, be alert, for you don't know when the time is coming. Now stop there. Um, I want to look at this passage... And it's not, I don't believe this is me. I believe this is what the Lord is saying. Um, a lot of people have taken this in sections from Daniel, sections from Revelation, and they've tried to create an understanding of how the end of the world is going to come or how Messiah is going to come back. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> what I want to share is uh, the microcosm of the macrocosm that's being described here. You see, God works in cycles, and he works on a corporate level and in a big way in time, but he does minor versions of that in individual societies, in churches, uh, in, in groups, in families, and in individuals. So everyone, whether you live to see Messiah come at the great big capital E end, or you don't. Everyone will walk this cycle, probably multiple times in their life. And so um, sometimes we think, oh, well, that's not yet, so therefore I don't have to pay attention to this portion. I can skip on over it. And, uh, and actually, every bit of scripture is applicable to us right now. I believe there will be a final E end. Uh, I can't tell you when that is, and I think the Bible tells us that it's it's a mystery. But I do know that I've walked this cycle, and anyone who's seeking the Lord will walk this cycle. In fact, that is the meaning of the little bit of the parable of the fig tree that he gives at that end. You know fig trees are not annuals. They're perennials. They bear fruit season after season after season. And when that tree puts forth its tender shoots in the springtime, then you know that summer is near. And there's going to be a growth cycle. And eventually that growth cycle will bear fruit. In fact, if it doesn't, you might end up like the fig tree a chapter or so ago that gets cursed. And so you expect the fig tree to walk a certain pattern agriculturally growing to the point of fruit bearing if we are walking in the lord we are like fig trees who will put forth that tender growth that promise of growth and we ought to be growing and bearing fruit and the the section that happened this whole chapter is about the process of bearing fruit it is what we can expect the end of the age is an interesting idea. 
the end of the age, we tend to think of the end of time as we know it. But there's also another way it can be understood and has been understood, not just in my little brain, but in, uh, according to rabbinic thought and other commentators have understood this, that there is an end to flesh nature, the age of man's rule, and the beginning of a messianic rule, and we understand this as believers, that when Messiah comes in and begins to rule in your heart, really, you move out of the way and he begins to reign. And that is another end of an age, if you will. It's the end of my self reign and the beginning of his reign. And it's a process that happens season of, after season after season. It's progressive. We're told um, um, here. Sorry. Verse 29 of this chapter, it says, In the same way, when you see these things happening, know that he's near. He is at the very door. I assure you, the generation, this generation, it, it won't pass away until these things happen. You can think of that on a corporate level, but you can also think about it in yourself. Uh, some people uh, will talk about it as the generation of mankind or within yourself as you are as you are believing these things are going to occur to you this is i this certainly will happen is actually the way it's and the Greek. it will definitely happen um within us he's going to accomplish his purpose although the timing isn't known okay so i want to go back and take a little bit of a closer look at what he says the first set of things he talks about the first stage where he says these are just the beginning of the birth pains He's, he starts out by saying in verse 5 watch out that no one deceives you many are going to come in my name saying I am he and they will deceive many okay Jesus has been walking around teaching the people describing who he is talking about the father talking about the kingdom of God people have received him and they've received his words and they've been astonished at his teachings. And Mark says over and over again, they were astonished at his teachings. They were astonished at his teachings. And yet he's here talking to his disciples, four of his closest, and saying, watch out that you aren't deceived. Because other people are going to come in my name, which means in my authority, they're going to say that they are from me. And they're going to speak to you, claiming that they're from me. And they're going to, you know, Satan's going to use them to try to deceive you, to get you off the path. Okay, so watch out that you're not deceived. Well, how do you not get deceived? You keep your eyes on Christ and what he says. You immerse yourself in what he actually says. And if it's not leading you to Christ, if that teaching isn't pushing you towards Christ, get rid of it. It's a false doctrine. It's a false teaching. So you have to look at what the end goal is of that teaching. And even if it uses a veneer of God or Christ, or whatever it gives a nod to it if it's not if Christ isn't central then it's it's no good get rid of it um, I think of this as, as I was pondering this this passage I was thinking back to that parable of the seeds and the sower that Jesus used um, it's if you want to look it up it is uh, Matthew 4 or sorry Mark 4 um, that whole section there is that parable of the sower. But the first place that he sows is not, there's hard ground there. And there's a, a hardness to it so the pure word of God can't sink in and take root. And the birds of the air come and fly in and eat the seeds that are there. Well, that same hardened ground is also open to deception. It's open to whatever pleases the flesh. Because the flesh isn't broken up. It's not humble before the Lord. It's too proud to hear from God. But it's perfectly happy to be of this world's nature. That's its natural hardened state. Then the second thing Jesus says in uh, verse 7. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. 
these things have to take place. Don't be panicked. Um, this version here, I uh, like the way they mention. He says, uh, make sure you're not thrown into a panic or given into your fears. Uh, when you hear about these wars and rumors of wars, you know, that's sort of like falling on that rocky ground where the persecutions and difficulties come, or at least perceived ones come, and it, there's no root that is established. And so you're thrown into this, oh no, what am I going to do? And if you don't have that root in the Lord, in Christ, then that word is is doesn't bear any fruit it just withers up and it dies we we tend to resort back to our uh, knee-jerk responses to troubles uh, whatever it is that our coping mechanism is we just go right back to that pre-programmed pattern of defensiveness or um, you know an addictive cycle or our uh, passive aggressiveness or whatever it is that we do coping. you know our coping mechanism we go right back to it. we don't even think about it it's just the natural pathway for us and if you don't have something that's that's rooted firmly in the Lord a new way of dealing with speaking out what God says is truth you won't ever grow um, then you have the uh, supernatural seismic events of epic proportion yeah. <laughs> uh, taking place famines and riots and and earthquakes and whatever's happening okay so the things that are of this earth get shaken and we get concerned oh no I might lose my job I might have this relationship fall out uh, you know there's gonna be no food in the world you know what are we gonna do and we bear no fruit because we have focused here on the earth that's that other type of soil the thorny soil that chokes out the pure word of God because we get focused on the stuff here and not the stuff that's eternal so you see these different types of soils that are sort of being hinted at here in this first level you can't even get to any kind of growth if those things become your attention then uh, you have a second phase of growth if you make it past that Jesus warns he says be on your guard be first you do not don't be deceived now be on your guard for they're going to repeatedly hand you over to the ruling councils and you'll be beaten in public gatherings and you'll stand trial before kings and high-ranking governmental officials be given an, an opportunity to testify this is really the second place now you're going to be bearing some fruit but it's going to come at a cost you know Christ has said just a chapter or so ago maybe two uh, that if you if you really want to follow me you got to take up your cross and follow me and he said that if if you don't lay down, you know, you're sort of foolish to try to hold on to your life here and then lose true life. Uh, instead, lay down your life for me and find real life. That's my, my paraphrase there. Um, this is, uh, if you want to look that up, that's Mark 8, 34 to 9, 1. You're going to be hated because of your allegiance to the Lord and to his message. Not just to Christ, but to the gospel, to the message that he is proclaiming. His message was a reconnection to God. It was a message of repentance. Turn away, humble yourself, turn away from your sin, and be reconnected to God. And, and that was an amazing message, particularly uh, angering to the religious group, because they were the ones who were saying, we have the way to God. How dare you come in here and question what we are promoting to the people? You're, you're rocking our authority. So that's why they were going to end up standing trial, just because it went against the establishment. This, um, I think it's interesting, he says at the end, if you are determined to be faithful to the end, you will be saved. 
it's funny uh, to me that it's in this standing up and allowing yourself to be persecuted in your verbal witness before people who are sort of against you, not sort of, really against you, even to the point of being betrayed by those who are family members, those who are intimate with you, that if you are able or willing, not able, I mean, it's, it's through Christ. In fact, it, this is where the Holy Spirit is mentioned right here, is that it's the Holy Spirit who's going to give you the words. And I believe it wouldn't be too much of a stretch to say it's the Holy Spirit who will enable you to be strengthened to stand up against the betrayal that's going to happen. It's in that power. And, and in walking through that, then you'll know you're saved. You know, there's a lot of believers out there who struggle with, am I even saved? Well, maybe you haven't come to this point. But when you start to stand up and say, no, Jesus is the way. What he said was true. You can know God. There can be peace in your life. And, and when you start to speak that out openly, and when people come against you and you don't waver, and when there's betrayals that happen and you still stand, then you know that you have a connection. You you have put your lot in with him. And he says that if you don't deny me before men, I won't deny you before my father. That was right after the take up your cross and follow me thing. Okay, so he's just sort of restating this in some ways. That's where the knowing of salvation. And then it brings us to this third phase here. Um which is the revealing, some say the son of perdition, or the ad abomination of desolation that's prophesied by Daniel back in uh, Daniel 9, and uh, the last part of it is in 12. And uh, he says here, when you witness what Daniel prophesied, the disgusting destroyer standing where it should not be, <laughs> or where it must not be, sort of interesting way of putting it, he said, let the reader learn what it means. Then those in the land of Judah must escape to higher ground. And then he says, don't even go back. Don't, don't go back for anything. Just get out of town. Get out of Dodge. And there's going to be a great destruction that's going to happen in Jerusalem. And we know historically this actually happened when uh, Titus came in and destroyed um, the the temple, and then later on, I think it was Hadrian who came in and destroyed Jerusalem completely. The whole city leveled it and rebuilt a new Jerusalem on top of it. So historically, we know that this happened. We believe prophetically it will happen again. But it happens in us, and here's how. You see, at some point in time, after this standing with the Lord, and proclaiming his name and um, even facing rejection and, and we've experienced that we can give personal testimony to this from friends and family and groups and so forth being kicked out of churches whatever because we're too extreme uh, too intense and and even after all of that there comes a time when the Lord in his mercy reveals the abomination of desolation in our hearts where we have in our heart something that we are sacrificing to that ought not be there at all it's a pig it's something filthy that has no business being in the altar of our hearts and you know god jesus said that the kingdom is within us Primarily, that's where it starts anyway, and then it's shared among us, building as a building out of people. So when we have inside of us a, sac a place of sacrifice, of worship, a high place that is not the Lord, we are the center of the abomination of desolation, and we offer to it. And at some point in time, God will reveal to us; He'll He'll show us that area. And it ought to make us want to throw up. We ought to be so disgusted at the revealing of that sin, of that pride, of that uh, hidden 
a coping mechanism or whatever it is that when we see it we need to be like what Jesus says run to the hills Judah it's, I think it's interesting he says those who are in the land of Judah Judah is praise I mean, he's talking about the Jews you know in the land of Judah but those who are truly up to the Lord those who really are giving praise to God separate yourself from that detestable thing and you know what happens is you begin to really recognize the truth that that the Lord has written down in his word that there are two different natures in your chest there's a nature that's a new creation that God has given you through his son and then there's this old self life separate yourself from it run to the hills Run to the Lord who is your rock and your fortress. That's where you're going to praise and worship him. And let the destruction fall on that abomination. Let the destruction of God happen there. That's why we got to stay humble. we got to allow that destruction of the flesh to happen. An utter destruction. And then you'll be free. You'll be allowed to live according to the spirit so this thing don't run back don't keep anything don't try to grab any clothing from for yourself you know clothing is always that good works or whatever don't don't try to keep the good and throw out the bad just get out of dodge get out and let God destroy it completely it's hard it's hard when you have family relations it's hard when it's cold outside it's hard when you think of all that you're going to lose you know the rich young ruler he's also in here this, this is exactly what happened to him he runs up to jesus jesus is actually heading out going somewhere the rich young ruler runs up to jesus kneels before him and says good teacher what must i do to inherit eternal life and jesus gives him a few things and he says i've already done these what else and he says okay Go take everything you have, sell it, give it to the poor, and come follow me. He revealed the thing that was on the altar of his heart. And the man's face sunk. And he was grieved. And he walked away sad, knowing that he couldn't do that. He wouldn't dethrone the one thing that kept him from really knowing the Lord, that intimate relationship. He wouldn't get rid of it. And because he wouldn't get rid of it, he walked away sad. That's what he's talking about here. It is an abomination of desolation for us to keep anything in our life that would vie for the Lordship of Christ. It is a destruction. It's an utter destruction. You know, our Messiah, he walked this way too. And, um, you know, he was our example, our example of how we were going to live. In the very beginning, there were people who spoke out against Christ, and they said, "Oh, he's he's like from teaching from Beelzebub. He's, he's he's got some sort of foreign teaching. He's not following." And you know that was the accusation. He's not following the ways of the fathers and all this stuff. And he said, "You know, Jesus said it's all about me. <laughs> really, I'm speaking what I hear my father speak." But the accusation was, "Is no, oh, you're speaking something else." And then uh, wars and rumors of wars and the panic that was the fears and all the stuff wanted to come in about the earthly things that we need. You know, he didn't even have a place to put his head. There was always wars and rumors of wars in Rome. I mean, that was just the political climate. They were always taking over someone. And they were going to conscribe you to go make you go serve in their military or whatever it is that they needed to do. Uh, it was an unrighteous government. And then earthquakes and shakings. I mean, Jesus even talked about earthquakes. Stuff falling over and people you know, getting squished. But he walked in a tumultuous time period. Uh, I think it sort of goes without saying that he was handed over to councils. Of course, at the end of his life, he was. But even as he walked around, he was constantly getting questioned. Every move he made. You know, well, what about this? What about that? What Should we pay Caesar tax? What about the temple tax? Do you pay that? 
And, you know, what about marrying? Who's, whose wife was she? You know, okay, teacher, tell me what's the greatest commandment. Okay, you know, it's like, let's give you a test every time you turn around. Eventually they did beat him. Eventually they did put him to death. Of course, he was betrayed by Judas. You know, he walked that road. And he was rejected by all of his disciples. He walked this whole thing. You know, I think one of the most amazing things, and this is the thing that amazed Pilate, was that he stood before his accusers and he said not a word. He didn't say anything. Why? You ever thought to wonder why? I mean, we could say, oh, it's because he was taking all of our sin on. Maybe he was really guilty in his flesh. He really was guilty because he had taken the sins of all the world upon him. So what could he say? I think he was also walking this out. He had separated himself. I think about it. He said just a, a few verses before when he was asked about the tax, he said, show me a coin. And they handed him a coin and it had Caesar's picture on it. And he said, whose coin is this? They said, it's Caesar's. He said, okay, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and render unto God that which is God's. Did he not do that in his death? Whose was his body? To what kingdom did it belong? God. Did it? It was a sin-cursed body in a sin-cursed world. And he had taken the sins of all the world upon himself, upon his shoulders. So in a sense, his body belonged to this realm. And he stood and said not a word. I believe he had separated himself in a way. And I'm not talking about some sort of mystical kind of thing. But at the end, what's one of the very last things he said? Father, into my hands I... Into your hands. Or into, into your hands I commit my spirit. He rendered unto Caesar that which was Caesar's, or the ruler of this earth. And he gave back to God that which was God's. Because his spirit belonged to God. The spirit of man belongs to God. Oh, and he... When he saw the destruction coming, he ran to the mountain. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Did not get his clothing either. <laughs> it's amazing, the parallels. And we'll walk the same, the same road. And it brings a death. And it's a horrible, a horrible death to the flesh. But it brings freedom of the spirit. And it always brings birth because brokenness you have to be broken open for new to come, for new life to come, for that seed that was planted, to go back to the parable. The, the ground has to be broken open for the seed to go into the ground, for the, for the seed to be broken open so that life can come out. And Christ's body had to be broken up, open for our life to come out. And it's always this picture of, we, we have to go through this process, this painful process of breaking for new life, a mother goes through it. She has to be broken open for a baby to come out. This, this is the way it works. Yeah. And to try to avoid it is fruitless, literally. You won't have fruit if you won't willing to be broken open. So, he says this. Um, And I lost my place. If it was possible, they would, uh, it says, uh, when you hear reports, okay, sorry, let me back up here, verse uh, 20, 20, I think. Um, Unless God limited those days, no one would escape. But because of his love for those chosen to be his, he will shorten that time of trouble. And I believe that is so true. God is the God over our chaos. And he, he, in the prophets it says, bread corn is not crushed forever. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. He knows what he's doing for you to bring forth fruit. His goal is not to destroy you, it's to refine you. It's to bring forth the fruit. Hallelujah. 
And so he will limit the days yes. to bring forth the fruit because he's, he's, he's not intent at destroying you, although Satan will tell you that. Satan will tell you that in your ear, that he's just going to utterly annihilate you because he's angry with you or because you're not worthy or whatever lie he whispers in your ear. That's not the point. He limits these days for the saving of the, of the elect. His goal is salvation. He said, but if you hear reports from people saying, look, Messiah's over there, Messiah's over here, don't believe it. For there will be imposters falsely claiming to be God's anointed one, and false prophets will arise to perform miracles. If possible, they would cause God's chosen ones or the elect to wander off the right track. Be alert, for I prophesy this will happen. Now this is very similar to where he started this whole discussion. Don't be deceived. There will be other people who come in my name and my authority. And he ends with, don't be deceived or be alert or watch out. There's going to be people who are imposters who come in my name who are going to try to deceive you and get you off the right track. And it's at the beginning and at the end, and I think we even see that hint in Christ's life. When he starts his ministry, he's driven by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness and he's tempted of the devil. We don't really see the devil too much until the end when he's heading towards the cross. And once again, there's that, that temptation to get off the track. The devil uses Peter. To say, no, no, Lord, forbid it. Don't go this way. Of course you're not going to die. You're going to take over Rome, you know, throw out Rome and take over the kingdom and, and reign and all this stuff. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Your thoughts are not on the kingdom of God. They're on the earth. And so there's two different times with the beginning and at the end where Satan seems to sort of focus his energies at trying to get you off track. How do you get off track? You get your eyes off of Christ. And I think that's what happens to some of these people who they started out so well and they, they have this faithful life and maybe have a ministry and they have whatever it is that they're doing and people go, wow, you're such a godly person. And the deceiver comes in at the end and gets you off track, gets you just a little focused on something else other than the Lord or maybe incites your flesh or that, that seed of greed or or that that secret fantasy life you never took care of or whatever it was whatever little abomination you left in your mm. heart that you didn't you didn't allow the Lord to deal with you on and because you weren't willing to be broken you get off track right at the end oh god don't let us get off track at the end to walk 50 years with the Lord and foul it up in the last 5 Be on your guard. My prayer this week is let me die the death of the righteous. Amen. I don't want any kind of, any accolade or any claim. I said to one of my sons, I said, I pray that the Lord will keep me low because if your face is in the dust, you can't fall. What a sad thing. What a terribly sad thing. To die in disgrace. So, <clears throat> after the death, then uh, there's this uh, verse 24. It says, this is what will take place after that tribulation, after that suffering. It's not great rejoicing. <laughs> you notice that? It's darkness. After death comes darkness. The sun stops shining. The moon doesn't reflect the light of the sun anymore because the sun's gone. The stars fall out of the sky. If you know anything about sort of the way Jewish people think about stars, they think of them as messengers of God. There isn't even a message from God. There's nothing. Everything falls. Everything fails. You don't see anything. You don't know what's going on. But in the midst of this, and all the cosmic powers are shaken, I think this is, is, is a picture of that burial time period. That, you know, Christ, he died, and then he went in the ground for three days. And it was just quiet. It was rest. 
I was asking the Lord about this. I said, Lord, what is this? You know, just this dark, it's just whatever. And he reminded me of a time that we walked through when we were in Israel. And everything was dark. I mean, it was bright, sunshiny day, beautiful blue skies. It was great Mediterranean life. Except to, um, to me, spiritually, it was completely dark. Didn't know which way to go. Didn't know what to do. We had no direction, no word, nothing. There was just nothing there. And I was full of questions. And then finally, I wasn't. I like submitted to that whole process and the fact that I didn't know. And at some point, I said, okay, Lord, if we die, we die. Here we are. And I just stopped asking. And I just sat there in the darkness, doing what I knew to do, but really having no direction in where we were going. At that point in our life, we were packing up our meager belongings in an apartment, not sure where we were going to spend the next night. And I just packed because I knew we had to be out of the apartment. Our lease was up. And um, <clears throat> and there was a rest that came in that darkness. And I think that's where the Lord is trying to bring us to. Is that It's like that psalm of David, I've quieted my heart. Like a, like a weaned child at its mother's breast, I've just quieted my soul. And it doesn't matter that you don't know. It's... It's, I'm just going to rest that you know, and that's enough for me. It's enough for me to just know that you know, and you've got it in control, and I'm just going to be still and quiet, and I'm going to remind myself that I'm the child, and I'm just going to sit here. And that's that burial time period. And you know what? It's in that submission and that resting that the next couple of verses happen. Then they will see the Son of Man appearing in the midst of the clouds and revealed with mighty power and yes. great glory. Woo, Jesus. At that time, he will send his messengers. There was no news from, from heaven. Yeah. Now there will be messengers. Yeah. And what are they going to do? They're going to gather together his beloved from the four corners of the earth, from every direction, and they will bring him to himself. It's an intimacy that's going to occur with the Lord. And he's going to send out his messengers to gather us all together and bring us up. And, I, you know, I believe this happens on an individual level. It happens on a corporate level. No. It happens in within a community that is seeking the Lord and, 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 and just humbly bowing before him. And it happens in the church at large. That's what we call that revival. That's what wow, happens. What revival are. happens. Woo. Okay, is the church gets some life in it. Glory. It goes through the humbling process and the repentance process and the seeking God's face and allowing things to die yeah. that are abominations yeah. to him. And then in that darkness of just knowing that he's there and waiting patiently on him, then the Son of Man will be revealed to them in the midst of that. And great glory and great power will be displayed in him and flown down through us. Hallelujah. This Hallelujah. is the process. Glory to God. Jesus be praised. Yes. Hallelujah. That's the resurrection life. Amen. You know, Amen. after Jesus says, take up our cross and follow me, he's talking to the crowds at that point, and he says this last thing before he, he sort of dismisses the crowds. He said, there are some who are standing here who will see the Son of Man coming into power. Amen. And the very next story is the Mount Transfiguration. Mm -hmm. And at that Mount experience where he has Peter, James, and John, they're all up on the Mount, and Elijah comes down, Moses comes down, Jesus is standing in the midst, Jesus is brilliant, they have a revealing there, and then the Father confirms, this is my son, yes. listen to him. And the next statement is so interesting to me, Peter and James and John, they sort of like wake up out of their stupor there and they come to their senses and they see Jesus alone. That's it. And I think that's such a weighty statement. All they see is Jesus. Before it was Moses, the law, and the prophets, the spirit through the prophets, Elijah. They see these things and they see Jesus in the middle and they go, one, two, three, equal weight. God says, no, my son. Yeah. It's my son. Listen to him. Yeah. And then as they come to their recollection, like they, they, they can get their feet under them again, as it were, from being in, in this amazing glory. 
they see Jesus alone. And I think that's the end of this, too. Is when you come through and there's a revealing of the Son of Man and all of His greatness and all of His glory, what it does for you is it makes you see Jesus alone. Because it's all about Him. Ooh, the whole thing from beginning to end. This is a cyclical thing. So when we talk about having a fresh anointing for a new season, this is a cyclical thing. We should be asking the Lord to show us where the abominations are in our own heart. We should have constantly ground that is ready to be planted with the pure word of God Amen. in our heart. We should be willing, season after season, to stand up when called upon to speak the name of the Lord boldly as His Holy Spirit gives us utterance. We should be willing to be rejected by man, willing to be betrayed. It should surprise us. In fact, the, the apostles, they say over and over again, don't be, a, don't be surprised. What are you surprised about? Peter, I love the section you, that was in the book there, 1 Peter 5. Just pray that, don't be surprised at the fiery troubles that are going to come, yeah, right, come against right. you. Yeah. It's, this is it. This is what you signed up for. <laughs> be sober-minded. Be on your guard over and over again. And Peter, I think he was thinking about this. Be on your guard. Be on your guard. Watch out. This is what's going to happen. Suffer as a Christian. Don't suffer as an evildoer. And then you'll fill up the sufferings of Christ. Amen. Amen. This is a good thing. So what do we do in the interim? I love this. Because uh, there are some people who don't want to lose comfort. And so they will run to the nearest closet and hold them. You know, it won't be a prayer closet. It'll be a hiding closet. You know, they'll just hide themselves in the corner. Uh, as, as David put it, he says, with their blanket and their tub of ice cream, hoping that it will be over, you know? And maybe a puppy. And maybe a puppy. <laughs> okay. And there are others who are more like my husband who, who raise his hand and goes, let's join the persecuted church. <laughs> and that's sort of the other extreme. Let's go. <laughs> what do you do? So verse 34, I think, answers this for us. Um, for those days could be compared to a man who was about to leave on a journey. But before leaving, he placed his servants in charge and he gave each one work to do while he was away. And then he commanded the watchman to be on guard at all times. And so I say to you, keep awake and alert. For you have no idea when the master of the house will return. Over and over again. You, you hear these parables about the master coming back for the fruit that was his or for the talent that was his or for whatever was his. He entrusts you. He goes away. You go do your work faithfully, whatever it is he left you to do. And when he comes back, he's going to see. What did you do? Did you bear any fruit? Did you make that talent grow? What did you do? And then he'll judge based off of that. And oftentimes, the way it ends up is that for those who were faithful, he'll give more. And those who were not faithful, he'll take away what you did have, and, and off you go. Usually to not a good place. Where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Or maybe he'll divide you up into pieces, like one of them says. Yeah. He'll cut you up into little pieces. It's not pleasant for those who reject the grace of God. Those who openly put aside his favor and aren't faithful to him. Be alert. For you don't know when he's coming. In the evening, at midnight, at four o'clock in the morning, at dawn, be alert for he's coming suddenly. And he may find you sleeping. What I say uh, to the four of you, I say to everyone, be awake. At all times. Amen. You wake at all times. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for waking us up in this season. I feel like a lot of us were asleep. Father, I just pray that you would search our hearts. Mm -hmm. That we would remain humble before you. We would desire after you. Holding nothing back, Lord. May we make room for you in our hearts, moving anything. We'd be like 
Jacob said to his family, take any idols that you have, surrender them, let's get them out of here, and let's go up to the house of God, let's go up to Bethel and dwell there. Lord, may we dwell in your house all the days of our lives. It is better to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to sit in the gates of the wicked. Oh God, may we have our eyes on the things that are eternal. May your concerns become our concerns. Yes. May your desires be our desires. Your heart be our heart. Lord, may we not be afraid of the breaking, knowing yes. that you will not destroy us. You only seek our good. You only seek to set us free from self and sin. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for the work you are doing. I thank you for the redemption you've purchased for us. I thank you that you are our example. You walked the road before us. And we can walk after you as your bride because you went first. I thank you. I thank you and I bless your name for you are allowing us to participate in, in what you went through so that we can gain greater intimacy with you. How could we know you any other way? How could we know your selfless heart? How could we know unless if we are willing to lay down our lives for others? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, fill us with your spirit. Lord, we need you. We know that we cannot walk this road ourselves. We cannot do it ourselves. But we believe what you said is true, that you would give us your spirit and cause us to do the statutes and the ordinances that you give to us. I thank you, Lord. You gave us everything that is necessary for godliness and holiness. You said you would do it, and you did it, and we believe it, and we speak it out now. We speak it out now. You gave us a new heart and a new spirit, and you gave us your Holy Spirit, and it is enough. For you are the all-sufficient one, El Shaddai. I thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. May we be faithful witnesses unto the end. In your name we pray, mm. Yeshua. Amen and amen. Amen. Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, um, I feel real sheepish. I didn't plan on sharing this, I, but I just, little prompt. You need to share it. Um, I was driving um, from a, an audit one day, energy audit, and... Um, Words kept coming to me on, like, oh my goodness, there's a hymn that is being written in my head. Like, it's because I was just pondering on the Lord and just how there's no one who does not sin, but it is His great grace upon grace upon grace that is overflowing over that sin. And I, words started coming to write down for a song or a poem. You could put it to music, I guess. I don't know. It was called What Wondrous Grace. And I was like, okay. Well, if it came again, then I, I well, I better be faithful and write it down. So what wondrous grace could this be that my Lord died on that tree? What great sign from above that the Father sent the Beloved. What goodness could this be that my Jesus bled for me? What precious mercy is here and now seeing that thorny crown upon his brow? What mighty victory or death is won that powers of hell against me are undone? What glorious return shall be when my love, my Jesus, comes from me? <laughs> comes from me. Oh, how blissful tears shall cease, because arrival to Father's home brings peace. What can end internal strife? Please, please give Jesus your life. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God who poured out his precious blood. Hallelujah to the King of Kings. His victory and praises we will sing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.